415 Stories is brought to you by Mobile Action. Make your app business a success with world class data. Sign up on mobileaction.co and apply the promo code 415 to get 15% off for any plan. Hello everyone, welcome to this amazing episode of Forum 5 Stories. I'm your host, Taha. Today we are sitting down with Osan Atay, the co-founder and CEO of Billion to One. And Billion to One has recently developed, as they mentioned, a highly accurate and cost-effective novel COVID-19 test protocol. And they're unlocking more than 1 million testing capacity per day in the United States alone. They are a YC-backed company, and I can't wait to hear the news from him. And the CEO of the company, Osan, here. Hey, Osan, welcome to Pat. Thank you, and thanks for that introduction and giving me an opportunity to talk about uh, both what we are doing at Billion One in general, but also the COVID-19 test that we have developed. Sure, I'm pretty excited to hear the de- details from you, but first of all, who's Osan and what led you to create Billion to One? Um, so I, um, I came to the United States for my undergrad, which I did at Princeton, and as part of that program, um, uh, both my co-founder and I went through a, a integrated science program that really looked at biology from a very different perspective that combined all of these other disciplines like physics, chemistry, um, computer science to solve problems in biology in a quantitative way. So when um, I was doing my PhD at Stanford, there was this whole um change in the prenatal and oncology fields and uh, looking at this cell-free DNA, the DNA that is floating in our blood to be able to enable non-invasive tests that previously required invasive methods, uh, like being able to detect Down syndrome from uh, maternal blood instead of having to do amniocentesis. It was really impressive to see all of these changes that are happening at a very rapid uh, clip, but it was also a little bit um, disheartening to see how uh, expensive these tests were um, especially at that time, but also how limited some of the applications were. Um, and this was really due to this um, maybe qualitative approach that a lot of these um, tests had. So we thought that by bringing a quantitative approach, by changing how we look at um, these technologies, we could do so much more than what is available. Uh, and that's how it started. Great. So actually, I want to hear in-depth details about testing. So how billion to one can actually provide a million testing per day? So COVID-19 test is actually not something that um, that we were set out to do, right? So we are a cell-free DNA testing company um, that is by itself multi-billion dollar uh, mm-hmm. market. And we have normally no interest whatsoever in doing uh, infectious disease testing. But we have realized that one of the technologies that we develop for prenatal testing is actually extremely applicable to uh, being able to detect COVID-19 testing. And we also realized that it bypasses all of the supply chain problems that the current tests have. So in particular, all of the tests that are molecular right now, that, are, that they all rely on kind of the same two concepts. One of them is extracting the RNA from the virus. And the other part is using this quantitative uh, PCR mechanism to be able to amplify and detect that um, viral RNA, right? That first you change, first you converted it to DNA, and then you amplify that DNA in a mm-hmm. quantitative piece. The problem is that... Um, if there are a few companies that manufacture these RNA extraction kits, but even the biggest one, they, I mean, they just said, I think like at the beginning of March, and it is worse now, that they sold more RNA extraction kits in two weeks than the previous two years, right? Wow. So they have to manufacture hundreds to thousand times more of these kits than normal. And they are trying. I think everyone is working really hard to uh, essentially catch up with the supply chain problems. But what we realize is that our technology is so suitable because it bypasses that RNA extraction method and it uses not qPCR machines, but something that automatically can do 4,000 tests a day. And we have hundreds of these machines essentially sitting idle across the United States and not being used, right? So 
it's kind of really a simple lab, so we don't even want to do all of this testing ourselves. We want to enable everyone to use these idle machines to be able to do the testing, right? And it bypasses all of these supply chain problems. There are more than 500 up to 1,000 Sanger instruments in the country. So it's really a simple math to think, okay, we have 500 of these instruments. They are not even being used. And it is just if we use them, um, that would be, I mean, each one is uh, 4,000 tests a day. So that would be not even at 1 million, that would be 2 million to 4 million tests, right? Um, that, of course, requires essentially cooperation across different sectors. And in particular, we need to be able to get the word out to the other labs so that they can do it. I mean, we have a team of 40 people. We have 10 clinical lab scientists. Wow. If, I, if, if, if we did it ourselves, we would be doing, I don't know, somewhere between 30,000 to 60,000 tests with just 10 people in our lab potentially. But that would still be not enough for all of United States. So it is not as scalable, right? Yeah. So if we did it all ourselves, it wouldn't be scalable. It would be maybe monetarily more beneficial or something like that, like if we were doing it ourselves. But it's not what we want to do. We are not doing this. Uh, we are most Essentially, we are doing this in terms of a civic duty perspective. We want all these other labs to be able to use the unused instruments in a way that bypasses all of the supply chain problems so that we can actually do a million, two million tests a day. And there was a article, I think, just came out today. New York Times also put it on their, I think, front page. And the estimates are that we need half a million to a million tests, at least per day, to wow. be able to open the economy. And we are currently doing like 130 to 150,000 a day across all the different tests that we have. So now we have an opportunity to be able to actually open up this capacity. And again, this is not my core business. All of this is essentially to be able to enable all these other labs to be able to perform the testing. I mean, that sounds promising and it's kind of exciting. By the way, what's your predictions regarding to the duration of this outbreak? I mean, how long do you think that it will take until we go back to the real world, let's say? I mean, it really, I think, depends on what you define real world or normality mm -hmm. is. I think normality is defined as um, exactly the same as before. That would only happen when we have a vaccine. I'm not an epidemiologist. I have done some epidemiological work um, at the beginning of my PhD. Uh, so I am not the world expert on this, but I think mm -hmm. all the experts agree that uh, we will only go back to truly being in a normal pace of life when we have a vaccine. And everyone agrees that that will take at least a year. So what we really need, and again, this is not me, this is the experts agreeing, that we need essentially regular testing of people and contact tracing, essentially finding the asymptomatic people and then figuring out who they contacted so that those people can be tested as well and then isolated. And even with that, it will not be a true normal, right? That would allow us to go back to work. That would not allow us to go to, for instance, conferences with thousands of people. Yes, th that is actually great. I'm kind of hopeful about this process and i hope everything will go like hope the way that should it be and hi friends i'd like to tell you about something you probably know how hard an app business can be publishers don't know what apps to build how to monetize them or even what to price them at advertisers and brands don't know where their target users are how to reach them or even how much they need to spend in order to do so and investors are not sure which apps or genres are growing the quickest and where users are really spending their time and money at this point my friends in mobile action have a solution for you you don't have to guess Make your decisions based on data. Mobile Action helps you to make your app a success story. Companies like Disney, Tencent, Shipt, and Let's Go use Mobile Action to better grow their apps with world-class data. Sign up to mobileaction.co and apply the promo code 415. Join over 200,000 people using Mobile Action today. And let's get back to this amazing episode. I think we talked enough about the COVID-19, so why don't we just talk about your company? So. You're a YC-backed company, and 
you were in the summer 17 batch, right? Yes, we were in the spring summer 17 batch, yes. Wow, so how was the experience of going through YC? Just because I always ask this question to my guests, because many guests on the pod was in the YC in some way, and I wonder about the story. So how did you get in? Like, how things got came up for you? Um, so YC actually started backing us even earlier um, than when we formally got into the YC's core program. Mm -hmm. um, even when we were just starting out, um, and we had this, when we had this idea and potential method that could do much better prenatal testing, uh, YC uh, gave us essentially we went through their initial fellowship program, mm -hmm. which doesn't exist anymore. But that was really a good experience because it allowed us to really think about um, the market and the business aspects of bringing bringing a biotech or healthcare product to market. Because Gate Foundation sponsored a study that looked at why diagnostic companies fail when they do. And the vast majority of the time, it's not because they have a poor product. It's because there are all these external factors like reimbursement that they might not get paid even if they have a good product. Right? It might take years before the insurance companies and the reimbursement catches up. So it really forced us to think about the path dependencies and the business aspects of developing a product and bringing it into a market and not because they are experts on this it's just that they really force you to think out of box and they always ask why 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 right yes so it, it really forces you to really think about okay how we are really going to accomplish something so it was really useful to have that um, quite early on and then that allowed us to uh, essentially get a little bit of funding from angel investors develop the product and get us to the clinical trial stage. With How many have you raised so far? Uh, we raised a total of $32.5 million uh -huh. um, across many different funds. Like it was a, I guess, pre-seed round of half a million uh -huh. after the fellowship and then $2 million a year later after the YC core program and then $15 million series A after we had completed our clinical trials um, and we were ready to essentially get get our regulatory mm -hmm. approval and launch the test. And then fi another $15 million two months ago, um, that was essentially seven, eight months mm -hmm. after we launched the test because we showed so much essentially growth in our kind of numbers in terms of the interest and the demand that we were getting our Unity uh, screen. So we that is the last funding that we got was uh, from our internal investors for another 15 million, bringing the total to 32.5. Well, so do you think that this funding amount is enough for a startup like yours to operate in a great way? So um, I think that is another another uh, advantages of going through YC. It forces you to really value the money, especially um, if you go through YC at the right time, right? Um, the first ten, twenty thousand dollar checks that I got after uh, Y Combinator Fellowship were so difficult to get and required me to pitch in person like three times sometimes, right? right? It it was, and compared to that, the last fifteen million dollars that I got was literally an email to investors, <laughs> right? Saying that we are accepting more funding. If you want to invest, you can invest, right? So it really changes at what stage you are, but we never forget kind of where we came from and how okay. difficult it was to get those initial rounds of funding. So it, it, what you really need to do is to de-risk the company in stages, right? Uh -huh. As a, when you first start out, you can say that, oh, I need this, I need that, and I need this, and I need that, and I need $30 million. Mm -hmm. But you really need to kind of realize, okay, what do I, what do I can, what can I do, right, with half a million dollars, so that you can de-risk one component of the technology, and it, your company becomes more valuable, so that you can get more funding, right? Uh, better terms with a little bit more funding, you do more. A little bit more funding, you do more. So even for our Series A, what we said was, look, this is not. Um, sufficient for full-scale commercialization of a biotech product, 
right? Normally, biotech rounds are like $40 million for Series A. But what we said was, look, what we need to do is to essentially get our regulatory approval, get our clear license, build out the clinical lab, and have presence only in three states, three of the largest states, have field sales go out in those three states mm-hmm. and show that we can actually sell and grow this product um, and compete with all the existing products. And once we show that, we got another $15 million funding and now we can scale to all the other states. That's great. So how's the FD approval process, by the way? So for lab developed tests, so for our core business, that is uh, not FDA, but something called CLIA, mm-hmm. uh, C-L-I-A. Uh, so that process was um, that process is faster than FDA, uh, and in some ways it is more difficult, and in some ways it is easier. Does it requires uh, random trials in order to like pass the test, or? So it requires. So we had we had already done trials because for a novel product like this, if you don't have the clinical trial data, you are not going to be able to actually the doc get the doctors to order the test. Right. And it is the difference between CLIA and FDA. Uh, so if you are CLIA approved or if you have a CLIA license, you can only sell to physicians. So that is what we do, right? So all of our tests... You cannot go are, through the end user like with this yeah. CLIA approval. Okay. Yes. Like you cannot essentially just get samples from pregnant patients or cancer patients the way that like 23andMe goes to patients directly right so you need to convince each physician and the physicians are considered to be sophisticated enough to look at the data and to be able to say that this is medically necessary for my patient and the great thing about that model is that it's i mean especially in obgyn one obgyn takes care of 100 to 150 pregnancies uh, takes care of 100 to 150 pregnancies a year so once you convince a single OBGYN, that becomes 150 tests wow. per year. And it becomes a recurring revenue. And the way that we develop the test, we actually develop to ensure that um, these prenatal tests are reimbursable by all major insurance providers so that it becomes accessible to everyone um, in a way that most novel tests aren't. So... Um, insurance covers the test there is no cost to the physician and it is much better test than what is available mm-hmm. so that allows essentially us to go to physicians and kind of quickly explain to them look this is a much better test for you or your and for your patients without any additional cost so that makes essentially a very relatively fast sales cycle wow um so out of scope what's your perspective about like working from home just because I think that there is an adoption process right now. Everyone's like trying to figure out like the right setup, do you know, standing desk or regular one. So how do you think that like the future of working from home will be like for short term or long term? What's your prediction about that? Um, I, I don't think I am the best person to answer that question because we are healthcare workers. So we yeah, are so... exempt. And I actually go to work... Um, three to four times a week. I try to work from home whenever I can, but there are so many uh, lab-related things that mm-hmm. I have to do that um, most days I have to go to work. And we are, of course, taking a lot of precautions at work to make sure that everyone is safe. Uh, but it's not like I'm working from home a lot of the time, so not the best person. And uh, from my perspective, there are, I think, fields where working from home is probably very well suited if you have the right culture built around your country, around your company. Uh, for something like a biotechnology company that relies on lab work, it's probably not very possible to do that, or at least not very easily. Wow, I'm really glad for what you're doing, and I hope all the best for you and the company. So. That was a great chat, Osan. Thank you for joining me today. Yeah, no, thanks for giving me a chance to talk. Sure. So we came to the end of this amazing episode of Forum Five Stories. You can follow Osan on LinkedIn at Osan Atai. And you can see the Billion to One in action on BillionToOne.com. And please let me know what you think about the podcast via Twitter at Forum Five Stories. And you can subscribe to the channel on Forum5.substack.com. And thanks for watching. See you on the next episode.